power company. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians is where you want to be. Chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verse 1 and 2. I've got to talk really, really fast because there's so much. Even when Paul just says hello, he says so much in his very, very brief introduction uh, to all the letters that he writes. And just really sometimes we glance over those opening verses where Paul's saying hello, but there's so much deep, deep stuff in there. So Colossians chapter 1, we'll pick up in verse 1 and read the first two verses here in just a moment. As you can see today, we're beginning a, a new series through Paul's letter to the church there at Colossae. Uh, and over the next several months, I want to speak about this theme as the main theme of Colossians is the supremacy of Jesus Christ. He really magnifies who Jesus Christ is all throughout this letter. In, in the first two chapters, he's really saying, this is Jesus, and he is so much more superior to everything else in your life. And then as a result of all of that, in chapters 3 and 4, he'll say, here's how you ought to live your life in light of the reality of the supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Colossians is one of what we call four prison letters. Uh, Paul wrote Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then a letter to an individual named Philemon uh, while he was in uh, his first Roman imprisonment around A.D. 60 to 62. Uh, the founder of this church was not Paul. Most of the times we look at uh, these letters and Paul was the one who started the church, but in this case it was a man named Epaphras. We'll look at him in more detail next week, but Epaphras was a man who got saved while Paul was ministering in Ephesus for three years. But then he got so on fire for God that he went back to his town, uh, Colossae, and there he started this church. Isn't it amazing that somebody would just get saved and already have enough God in them that he would go back and immediately start a new church and then lead all his family and friends to faith in Christ? Because he really had a burden to see God do a great work uh, in and through his life. And so we ought to have that same burden. And we'll see how next week uh, Paul calls him a very faithful bondservant of the Lord. And so we're going to be looking at that. Now the founder and the pastor of this church, Epaphras, he began to notice some false doctrines. And he was a new convert, so he was ill-equipped to handle this controversy, what we call the uh, Colossian controversy there going on in his hometown in the church there at Colossae. The Gentiles in the town... They were pulling these new converts in one direction, trying to pull them back into paganism, talking about Gnosticism, this, this superior knowledge, and saying, what you really got to do, you got to get more knowledge, and that's how you get closer to God. And then the Jews on the other side were given false teachings about who Jesus Christ was. So they're being pulled in one direction with the Gentiles going back to paganism, in another direction they're going into false doctrines led by false Jewish teachers. Now the situation was not yet critical, but Epaphras being a new convert, he needed the wisdom of his mentor, the Apostle Paul. So he goes there to uh, Rome where Paul's in imprisonment, tells him what's going on, and then Paul gives him this letter to carry back. Now Colossians deals with many key doctrines, and we'll look at them over the next few months, uh, that are very essential to the Christian faith. However, the main theme of this letter is that Jesus is God and that he is sufficient for salvation. Uh, look, look what he says there in, in chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. He says, For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. All of God was found in Jesus Christ. And in him, in Jesus, you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. What he's saying is that Jesus is God in the flesh, and he is all that you need. You do not need uh, greater wisdom. You don't need to obey all of these Jewish rules. What you need is Jesus Christ reigning supreme in your life. Well, let's take a quick look at Paul's opening greeting. And I'm speaking on this subject this morning, greeting new friends. Greeting new friends. Colossians chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 and 2. Let's stand together all over the building. There at home when your Bible's opened up. As we honor and reverence the reading of God's perfect word. Colossians chapter 1, reading verse 1 and 2. You following as I read, because this now is God's holy word. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. Let's pray together. Uh, 
Our eternal God, we are so grateful that you have allowed us to come into your presence to humbly bow down and worship you. And Lord, how you stirred our hearts in Sunday school already. How you stirred our hearts through the songs that we have sung. And our hearts cry is, as we have sung earlier, that greater things will happen right here in this city. May it begin in this room. May it begin in each and every one of our hearts. And Lord, may you use us to inspire and encourage and challenge others and to lead many to faith in Christ, even as Epaphras did in his day. Father, we pray that if there's anybody lost who's in this room or watching online, we pray that even now you would draw them to yourself, that they might cry out to you for mercy and for grace before it's too late. Father, anybody walking at a guilty distance, we beg you to bring them back home to you. Father, anybody with a burden, let them lay it down at the foot of the cross. Speak, and we will obey. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Well, just three simple thoughts, and Debbie always likes simple thoughts because it keeps her from having to type too much. The first thing that we notice is the focus of the servant. The focus of the servant. So Paul is doing what he normally does, just opening up and saying hello before he really gets into anything deep. And he shares with us his calling. Look there, verse 1. He starts out simply with his name, Paul. Now, normally when we write a letter, we put it at the end of the letter. But in the custom of his time, which to always state in the very beginning who the letter is from. Now, other than Jesus Christ himself, there was never a greater missionary statesman than the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul was the most influential person uh, that has ever lived other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Uh, he started most of the church we read about in the New Testament. Uh, he wrote two-thirds of the books that we read in the New Testament. He was all over the place, leading people to Christ everywhere he went. It uh, didn't matter who they were, didn't matter what their station in life was. Paul loved them, and he wanted them to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so Paul was a man on a mission. Paul was a man who had a brilliant mind. Even Peter would say in his letter that some of what Paul wrote was difficult to understand. Now, can you imagine that? The apostle Peter hadn't walked with Jesus three and a half years. He said, I can't figure out what some of Paul's writings are all about. He was a brilliant mind, and he had an unyielding passion. He would not give in once God set him on the right path. It could be said about Paul, he was intellect on fire. Intellect on fire. He was a brilliant man, but he wasn't dull. He was a passionate man because he loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and he loved people. He calls himself here an apostle. Now, normally you'll see that Paul, when he opens up a letter, will say, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. But here he calls himself an apostle. Not because he was trying to brag on his, his station in life, the fact that he was one of the apostles, say, I'm better than you. But the reason why he is doing this is because he had never met these people before. Chapter 2, verse 1 reveals that truth. So he doesn't know who these people are. Uh, they don't know who he is. And some of them might have said, Paul, what right do you have to tell us to do these things. And Paul was saying, I have the authority under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of Almighty God, that God himself has called me to be an apostle. And as a result of them not knowing who he was and him having to send them some correcting doctrines, he wants to establish his authority to say, these are not my opinions, this is the word of Almighty God. Now that phrase there, that word, an apostle, is the Greek word apostolos, and it means one who is sent with a mission. We might ask, what was the mission that Paul was sent on? It was to win the lost. Paul had an unyielding desire to see as many lost people as he could possibly find come to know Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. But then we'll see later on in the chapter, he states one of his really mission statements. He says, what I want to do is not only preach Christ in such a way that folks will get saved, but then I want to mentor them. I want to disciple them so I can present them to Christ as complete and mature in Christ. So what did Paul want to do? He wanted to find lost people, introduce them to Jesus, and then help them to live the victorious Christian life which should be the desire of all of us. We should all have a burden in our heart for those that are lost and on the way to hell. We ought to say, I want to do more than just create a whole bunch of decisions. I want to make disciples. I want to see folks get saved, but then get plugged into the church and get on fire for Almighty God. 
So notice he says it was by the will of God. He said, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ, and I am so because it's the will of God that I would be an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul was not an apostle because he had an ambition and said, you know what, I really admire Peter and John and Luke and all the other guys, and I really want to be more like them. I want to be an apostle too. It wasn't because the disciples sent him and said, hey, Paul, you're a brilliant guy. You seem to know your Bible pretty good. Let's go ahead and make you an apostle. He wasn't an apostle because the church sent him and said, we need a guy like Paul out there on the road representing us. And listen, he wasn't an apostle because his mama sent him. He was an apostle because God Almighty himself made him so. They had a saying, I told you before, in Bible college that some are called, some are sent, some just got up and went. And there was too many mama called preachers there at the, church, at the uh, college, and they didn't stick around. And they're not even in the ministry any longer because God never called them to do it. God's calling is without repentance, which means if he's called you, then hang in there. Uh, Johnny Hunt was talking to a bunch of us preachers one time, and he says, if you can quit, quit. But I can't quit. I said, Johnny, I can't quit either. Because I'm like Jeremiah. The fire is shut up on my bones and he won't allow me to quit. So too many have fallen by the wayside because they were never called in the first place. They thought that ministry was going to be a lot of fun. They found out it's not so easy. Now whatever your calling is and whatever the ministry that you perform, it must be a divine calling from Almighty God. We put it out on Facebook that the 20th marked 20 years since I was ordained. This Bible here is the Bible they gave me when I got ordained on May 20th, 2001. In the front of this Bible, I have all the names of all the guys that were in the ordination council. And one very particular to Betty. Love it, Stone. And there's all these guys that are on here, and they took me in a room, and they drilled me for an hour and 45 minutes, asked me all kinds of questions to see if I was called or not. Joe Douth, the pastor there, he was not the pastor on that very day because a new pastor came in, James Fortenberry, but he was the pastor when I got licensed at that church at Lockhart, and then I came back a year later already serving in the ministry, and they said, we want you to get ordained, and I said, I'm going to go back to the church where they licensed me, and I want them to ordain me, and I went back over there. And they all asked me all these questions, except for Joe Douthit. And then he came to me afterwards and said, John, I don't want you to feel like I was being rude in any kind of way by not asking any questions. I didn't need to ask any questions because I've observed your life. But one of the questions they asked me was, what will you do if we decide here this morning that we are not going to ordain you? And I told him, I'm going to do what I've been doing for the past year. I'm going to go back and I'm going to preach the word of God without your piece of paper. Because God himself has ordained me. I don't need an ordination paper from a Southern Baptist church. I need a divine calling of Almighty God. And if God has given you something to do, you don't need permission from anybody else. You say, God has called me to do this, and I'm going to submit to the authority and the will of God. They didn't even have ordination papers back in Paul's day. That's something we've come up with. It's really, it's, it's a legal thing. They give you that reverend title when you get ordained. You're needed to do weddings and, and funerals and things like that. Uh, but it really is just nothing but a piece of paper. And a lot of folks got the piece of paper, but they've never been called by God. And, and some never had the paper, and yet God used them to touch the world. And so when God has called you to do something, you just simply say, God himself has called me, and I'm going to obey him. So Paul was not an apostle because he wanted to be, because the church wanted him to be, because the disciples said to do it. It wasn't a career move for him. God himself called him to do that very thing. And he could not turn from that calling. And he gave his very life in that calling. Now he said there in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Now we have not been called as apostles like Paul, although some people like to use that title, the, the, the proper phrase for an ordained minister today is a pastor. But some like to use the word apostle. But in the sense of Paul, uh, we are not apostles like him. However, we all have been called by God to win the lost. 
We have this verse in our hallway to remind us, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, just one of the five places that Jesus gives us what we call the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. We start with our neighbors, and then we press on until we reach the end of the world. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When somebody gets saved, there'll be a desire in their life to get baptized as quickly as possible. And then what do we do? Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. We looked at it last week in our study of our buddy Cornelius and how he has such a passion. He was more passionate, Janine, than most of the church members today because when he found out a guy named Peter is going to come here and he's going to answer the most important question you'll ever ask, what must I do to be saved? And he said, you go find Peter, you bring him here, he'll tell you how to get saved. And then Cornelius said, well, I got a deep burden to make sure all my family and friends get saved too. So when Peter got there, he said there was many people there because he gathered up all of his family and all of his friends. And then after they got saved, and, Paul didn't, and Peter didn't have to even give an invitation, the Bible said the Holy Spirit fell upon him while Peter was still speaking. He, they interrupted his sermon. Nothing wrong with divine interruptions, Chad. I, I pray that folks who get saved and say, you know what, I can't even wait, preacher, for you to give me the invitation. I've got to come down and follow my faith before Almighty God. Amen. And so they got saved. And then Peter said, well, if they got saved, they've got to get baptized like we did. So they got baptized. And then you know what they did? They asked Peter, hey, would you stick around for a few days and mentor us? Because we really don't know how to pray. We've been doing it for a long time, but we weren't praying to the right God, and we didn't know how to pray. Would you tell us about tithing? Should we give off the gross or the net? Would you tell us how to serve? Because we don't know what our spiritual gifts are. Can you help us out with all that? And so they asked Peter to stick around for a few days. Lydia asked Paul to stick around for a few days when she got saved. So if somebody's really born again, you don't got to chase them down the street and say, hey, by the way, we got these wonderful life groups. We'd love to have you come. We'll give you coffee if you'll come. They will come and ask you, hey, I've been reading my Bible and I got a lot of questions. And so they want to learn. So it says teaching them. You can't teach somebody that doesn't show up. Teaching them to do what? To observe all that I commanded you. Wait a minute now. What did he just command them to do? To go and make disciples of all nations. So it says when you lead somebody to faith in Christ as quickly as possible, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then get them plugged into a life where they can learn and grow in their walk with God. And then you've got to tell them, it doesn't end with you. Just as I have led you to faith in Christ, you not, my, now must go and find other people and lead them to faith in Christ and then get them plugged into a life group. And so he says, teach them to deserve all that I commanded you. You say, yeah, but Pastor John, I'm afraid to do that. You don't have to worry about it because he says, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So you don't need Billy Graham to go out and visit with you. You don't need the Apostle Paul to go out and visit with you. you got Almighty God visiting with you. You can't find a better soul winner than Jesus. And so we are to go and make disciples of all nations. And he didn't just give that to disciples. He said, I want you to tell everybody you lead to faith in Christ, do the same thing. Warren Wiersbe said, if people are to be saved, they must hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You cannot get saved without hearing the gospel. And if they're to hear, we who are saved must carry the message. Remember what we studied over the last four weeks with Cornelius? Why couldn't the angels tell him how to get saved? Why did the angels show up and say, go find Peter? And they had to take a two-day journey and go get the right Simon to bring back to them to give him the gospel. Because an angel has never gone from being a seeker to being a saint. So they have no idea how to get saved. It is not for them to tell the story. It is for us who have been saved to say, let me tell you, I too was once where you are. I too was once on my way to hell. Had no idea who Jesus Christ was. Had no desire to serve the Lord. But then somebody gave me the glorious and wonderful news that Jesus loved me, he died for me, and he wants a personal relationship with me, and I embraced that reality, and now I want to come and share that reality with you. Wow. Well, Paul mentions his calling, but he also mentions his companion. Notice his companion right there in verse 1. He says, and Timothy, our brother. And Timothy, our brother. Who is Timothy? Timothy is his son in the faith. Paul had led him to the Lord and then picked him up on the uh, second missionary journey. 
And he surrendered his life to the Lord as a young age, and then he sat under the ministry of the Apostle Paul and traveled all over the world with him. And Paul poured his life into Timothy. And he was there even to the very end. His final letter would be a letter to Timothy, what we call 2 Timothy. And he would say, Timothy, my time is about up, but I want to challenge you to press on. And the indication in the letter is Timothy was wavering a little bit. And he's saying, Timothy, you're going to have to be tough now. Ministry's not easy. You're going to have to circle back around. Remember what God has done in your life and be faithful because you're not going to have me here to help you any longer. And so he poured his life into Timothy. Now, notice he says, our brother. Paul never had the attitude of superiority towards anybody. He didn't say, my sidekick, Timothy. He didn't say, the guy that I'm mentoring, Timothy. He called him his brother. He put him on equal terms as him. He viewed every Christian as his brother in Christ. He did not say, I'm an apostle and you're not Timothy, therefore I'm better than you. He simply acknowledged that he was equal to him by calling him his brother. But notice he doesn't just say, my brother. He says, our brother. He is writing to a church that he's never met. And no doubt Timothy has never met them as well. And they're saying, he's saying that we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we have friends that serve in other churches, uh, and yet they are on the same team as us if they are preaching Jesus Christ. And one day, John said, he's going to look in glory, and he said, I found people from every tongue and tribe and nation. And there is no Seminole Springs Baptist Church in heaven. There's only God's people. And so we're all on the same team if we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And he says, he's not just my brother, but if you're born again, he's your brother too. So he says, we're all part of the same family of God. Now notice what he says. He says, and Timothy, our brother. This simple statement reminds me that like Jesus, Paul was always investing in others. Uh, he never just did ministry on his own because he understood we are part of a relationship, part of a family. And Jesus always had people that he took along with him. Sometimes he would preach to thousands in a big crowd like the Sermon on the Mount. Other times he would just talk to a few. And Peter and James and John would say, come with me up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Or he would teach them truths just by themselves. And so Jesus modeled that, that we don't just do the ministry, and then when we leave, it's all of a sudden over, but he was bringing along those alongside of him. And Paul did the same thing. He was always investing in somebody else. And we ought to do the same thing. Now, one of the reasons why I always bring somebody in when we go in and sit down and I'm witnessing to somebody, I want to mentor other people in the church and bring them along. Show them how to properly witness. Them. Show them how to properly counsel other people and bring them along in it. That's what Larry Leonard did to me when I got saved and when I first started going to Lockhart. And I remember the very first time that we had led some people to faith in Christ. Larry did all the talking. He really did everything. He's the one that led them to the Lord. But then we presented them uh, the next Sunday there in the church. He said, and John led these people to the Lord. All I did was pray with them. But Larry did all the talking. But he knew if I would bring him in there, then you'd really get on fire. Uh, once you see somebody go from being a lost sinner on the way to hell to being saved, it really puts a desire in you. Let's go find somebody else. Let's give them the gospel too. And pray that God would use us. And so we've got to bring others along with us. And Paul always did that. Every letter he always mentioned who was with him. He never had the attitude he was running a solo act. The question is this morning, who are you investing in? Are you bringing along others? It might be that you're only investing in your kids. Are you bringing along your kids? Are you mentoring your kids? Or are you just hoping that Gene's going to do it in Sunday school? So we need to be mentoring others and pouring our lives into others. Well, you not only see the focus of the servant, but what about the faithfulness of the saints? The faithfulness of the saints. So look at verse 2. So he said, who's writing a letter? Paul. And he said, I'm hanging out with my, my brother, my buddy here, Timothy. And it's 2. The letter is to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are at Colossae. 
Notice that word saints, the very misunderstood word. Paul said he is writing to the saints in Colossae. Brian, did you know that you're a saint? Now Sarah said, I, I know a little better than you and I might question that. But you are a saint because you know the Lord Jesus Christ. That word saint is the Greek word hagios and it means holy ones. We are holy not because we live such a great life but because the Lord Jesus Christ has made us holy. He has cleansed us of all of our sin and made us perfect in our position before Almighty God. Even though we may not be perfect in our practice and how we live our daily life, we are perfect in our position. It refers to those who have been separated from sin and set apart for God. Uh, the Bible calls believers saints. And what it basically means is a Christian, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, somebody who's been pulled out of a life of sin and surrendered themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and is now set apart as a personal possession of Almighty God. And so we ought to be set apart. If there's been no repentance from sin, there is no salvation. As the old cliche goes, no change, no Christ. If we have not been made a new creation in Christ Jesus, we are not really a born-again Christian. But that word saint is so misused today, especially by the Catholics. Listen to what John Philip says. A saint in the New Testament is not some person who has been canonized by the Roman Catholic Church, immortalized in a stained glass window, or whose relics are worshipped and supposed to perform miracles. A saint is simply any sinner who is saved by grace. So even though we don't act like saints all the time, if we're born again, we are a saint. And we like to call different people saints. What we're really doing is we're using the word in the wrong way. Saint Peter, Saint Francis of Assisi, and we have all of these different saints. And if they're not born again, they're not a saint. And if you are born again, everybody's a saint. Now it's one thing to be a saint, to be saved, to be a Christian. It's another thing to be faithful. Well, these believers there in Colossae were not only saved, they were saints, but they were also faithful. He says there in verse 2, and faithful brethren. He's not talking about a separate group, the saints and the faithful brethren. He's saying that they're saints and they are also faithful brethren. A lot of Christians are not faithful, but thank God for the ones that are, that really inspire and encourage us. Now remember, Paul had never met these people, but yet he's running under divine inspiration, so he's not just trying to flatter them. So Epaphras must have told him, hey, the people over there that have gotten saved, they're really faithful, Paul. You'll be proud of them. Paul commends the faithful believers in Colossae, and they had a good example to follow in their pastor. We'll look at that next week in, in verse 7, but look what it says there. He says, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, so he never recognized himself as being somebody superior. He only opened up with the acknowledgement of him being an apostle because they didn't know him and had to confront some doctrines that were false there. But he said, I'm a fellow bondservant, as is Epaphras, as is anybody born again Christian, who is a faithful servant of Christ. A faithful servant of Christ. God helps me faithful servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many folks want to get saved so they can avoid going to hell, but they really have no desire to serve God. They have no desire to give. They have no desire to serve. They have no desire to read their Bible. They have no desire to witness other people. They have no desire to show up to church. They just want to miss hell and get into heaven. And the Bible knows nothing about that kind of salvation. If you're a born-again Christian, you must acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And the word Lord means boss or master or ruler, one who is supreme in authority. And so either he is in charge of our life or he's not. Remember what we looked at last a few weeks ago with our buddy Peter when, when God came to him and gave him a vision and he said, not so, Lord. And you cannot say no and call him Lord. A slave never tells the master, I will not do it. And so we've been bought with a price. We no longer belong to ourselves and we will obey what God says. Or he is not our Lord. So he was a faithful servant and we'll look at him more next week. So in verse 2, the Bible says he was writing to the people there in Colossae. Now every city has wickedness 
Every city has false gods. Every city has temptations. Every workplace has got its own set of struggles and de to deal with. Every family's got somebody in there who wants to push your buttons and really see if you're born again or not. Everybody's got to struggle with this stuff. Paul told us a couple months ago that there's no temptation that's overtaken you, but such is common to man. He said, you're not the only one facing these struggles. Everybody's dealing with the same struggles you're dealing with. And so how can we remain faithful to God when others are trying to give us uh, to give, 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 give in the temptation and sin? Remember, they're being pulled in two different directions here. That's the Colossian heresy that we'll look at over the next few months. One's trying to say, come back this way towards paganism. The other one's saying, let's go over this way towards legalism. So they're being pulled in two different directions. So how can we resist all of that? By remaining in Christ. You see what he said there in verse 2? It is the faithful brethren in Christ who just happen to be at Colossae. Jesus Christ is our only hope. He's our only hope of salvation, and he is our only hope of sanctification. In other words, he's our only hope that we might get saved and have our sin debt paid in full, and he is the only hope that we're going to live the victorious Christian life. So how can I resist temptation and stand firm even when those around me are giving into it and try to encourage me to give into it? It is by remaining in Christ. I love that song, Chad, by Kenneth Getty and Stuart Townsend uh, called In Christ Alone. And that last stanza, Gene, is really powerful. It says, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first crime to final death, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Now, I know you want me to sing that, Lewis, but my throat is just a little bit sore. Thank you. And what hope we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so from my first breath to my final breath, from the moment I'm born to the moment I'm called to glory, Jesus commands my destiny. And I can only stand if I stand in Christ. Uh, when he was given a Sermon on the Mount, and he said, hey, there's two groups of folks here listening to me. There's one group, and here's what they're doing. They're building their life on the sinking sand. And life is going to present them some struggles and trials. Some storms are going to come into their life. And what's going to happen is they're not secure in their foundation, so they're going to fall all apart. But there's another group of folks here listening to me. And he says, and those individuals are hearing the exact same words. They understand exactly what I'm saying, but they are going to take what I'm saying and apply it to their daily life, and they're going to build their lives on the solid rock of Christ. He said, they're going to face the same struggles everybody else is going to have to face, but they're going to stand firm because they're on solid ground. And the only way that I can remain faithful to God in the midst of people pulling me in this direction and that direction is if I am in Christ. How am I going to remain in Christ? I got to read my Bible. I got to pray. I got to get involved in life groups, come to the services, get plugged in. I got to fill my mind with godly things, godly songs. I got to hang around uh, people that are going to challenge me to be a better Christian. I don't want to hang around Christians who are lazy, who are cheap, who don't serve, who don't show up to church. They're never going to inspire me to do anything great for the kingdom of God. I want to hang around people going to say, you need to give more. You need to serve more. You need to witness more. You need to do more because time is running out. And one day you're going to give an account before Almighty God for how you've used your money, your time, your talents, everything. And so I will never remain firm and stay in Christ if I'm hanging around those who are not inspired to do anything significant. So we've got to stay in Christ. And Jesus said, if you'll remain in Him, in John 15, 5, then you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you cannot do a single thing. So where is Colossae? He says there that they are faithful because they're in Christ. They just happen to be living in Colossae. Now, this city is no longer in existence. But in the time that Paul wrote this letter, it was located about 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was a seemingly insignificant city. Now, had it not been for this letter, we would not know really anything about Colossae 
at all. Colossae was not a booming metropolis like Rome. It wasn't a hub of religion like Jerusalem. It wasn't a center of wisdom like Corinth. Yet it is still known about even 2,000 years later by people all over the world and is known for one thing. There was a group of faithful Christians there and Paul had to write them a letter. Do you realize that Eustace is a small, seemingly insignificant town in the middle of nowhere? We got people on here from California. Unless they go on a map, they would never know where Eustace is. We got them on here from Ohio. We got them on here today from Staten Island, New York. Do you know that God loves Yankees? All right, John. There's hope for even Yankees. Okay? And God loves everybody. And we got a lady on here... Janine, even from Africa. I don't know how in the world she even found us over in Africa. She's about ready to go to bed. Want me to shut up so I can, she can go to bed. And yeah, she has no idea where Eustace, Florida is. And she even knows where Florida is. It is a seemingly insignificant town in the middle of nowhere. Now, we are not known for anything significant in this town. Now, we are not known as Hollywood is for movie studios. We are not known as D.C. is for government buildings. We are not known for tall skyscrapers like New York and Chicago. We are not known for Mickey Mouse like Orlando is. We are not known for much of anything in this town. But listen to me now. If we will pray and beg God to make that first song that we sang a reality in our lives and say, God, greater things that will be done right here in this city and it can start in my heart and then permeate all the people around me, then great things can happen and people can say, when I think about Eustace, Florida, I don't think about government buildings. I don't think about movie studios. I don't think about skyscrapers. I think about a town that loves the Lord Jesus Christ. Nobody knows anything about Colossae except for the fact that there were some faithful Christians there. Now let me ask you a question. If my Bible says that God has no respect of persons, means he doesn't care, one is not more favored in his eyes than another, Paul's no more important to him than you and I are, Moses, just a guy like you and I, James was writing to his crowd and said, Elijah, no big deal, he was a man just like me. So if God's no respect of persons, then he must be no respect of congregations. If he can do a great work at First Baptist Woodstock, when Johnny Hunt went there, they had fired the pastor, fired the worship leader. They had split in half. They were running about 200. He was at a church running 900, doing very well. And they wanted him to come. They said, why on earth would I go to a church like that? I'm, I'm doing well in a church four times your size. And you want me to go over there and deal with all these headaches? But the Holy Spirit told me you got to go over there. And so they got desperate. They got on fire. They got excited. They started reaching out to other people. And the church grew. And they'll have a few thousand there, even with... COVID making someone drift away. But I remember I told you that 30 to 50% of people would never come back, never come back because of COVID. Even though they've been vaccinated, they can wear a mask, Dr. Fauci said it's okay now, they still won't come back because they used COVID as an excuse. And many Bible scholars and preachers, and I agree with them, believe that we are now in the middle of the great falling away that Paul talked about. And they're falling away and drifting off course. But God can do a work here that will blow our minds. And we'll say, how on earth did it happen there? You didn't even know anything about Woodstock, Georgia, until that church exploded up there. In fact, Johnny jokes around. He says, when they asked him, hey, would you come over here and talk to us at Woodstock? He says, is that where they had that rock concert? And they said, no, that was a little further north. Yeah. You, you were there, weren't you, John? Did you go to that concert? He doesn't remember his mind's a little fuzzy from back in the day. Hey, the place where we live, no matter where it is, it can be known because Jesus reigns in the hearts of the residents. We've seen the focus of the servant. We've talked about the faithfulness of the saints. But finally, let me just throw this out there to you, Lewis, and we're done. The favor from the sovereign. The favor... From the sovereign. Look what he says there at the end of verse 2. Grace to you 
and peace. Grace is a common Greek greeting. It's the word charios. And peace is a common Hebrew greeting, shalom. Uh, you and I say, hello, how you doing? What's up? But they would say, grace, if they were Greek, the Jews, the Hebrews would say, shalom. So what Paul does is he combined the two, the typical greeting in Greek in his day and the typical greeting in Hebrew in his day. And he combined the two to remind us that there is no separation among Jews and Gentiles in the family of God. There's about 11,000 Jews living in this town. There's a bunch of Gentiles there as well. So what Paul was saying is regardless whether you're a Jew or a Gentile in Christ, there is no separation. No Jew, no Gentile, no white, no black, no rich, no poor, no young, no old. All one in Christ Jesus. And so he combines the two greetings to remind the people there, don't get distracted and get pulled in two different directions. Stay centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul would start out with his greeting and pretty much all of his letters. It was a standard greeting for him. As I mentioned, we would just say hello. Paul reminds us of the source of both of these. He says that this peace and this, and this grace and this peace, and you notice that he always puts grace before peace because you must have the grace of God in order to have the peace of God. And it's by his grace that we receive his peace. So he always puts grace before peace. And he's pronouncing a blessing, and all he's doing is saying hello. He hadn't gotten into the letter yet. And he's saying, grace to you and peace from God our Father. The King James adds, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is appropriate as well. Because they all come from the same source. God our Father. But notice, in order to get the grace and the peace, God must be our Father, and Jesus Christ must be our Lord. You cannot get grace and you cannot get peace in any other source. Now, we always want to pray for world peace, pray that these cities will settle down and be peace in those cities. There will be no peace until the Prince of Peace comes back and says, enough is enough. And when he takes charge, then there'll be peace. And right now, there's turmoil over in Jerusalem. And the Bible teaches us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And we are to pray, and there will be no peace there. There will be turmoil until the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and says, Now, enough is enough. They will eventually set up another temple there, right next to the mosque. And the eastern gate, and I've been there, there's plenty of room to put the temple right next, next to the mosque. And the eastern gate is where you go in. They're going to open that gate up again. It's all closed up right now. And they will eventually walk up in there. But then three and a half years in, the Antichrist is going to proclaim that he is God. He's going to desecrate the temple. And three and a half years later, he's going to say, enough. And he's going to come back. And as the old cliche goes, he is not coming back to take sides. He is coming back to take over. Amen. And the question is, what kind of an impact are we having on our Colossae? You can be in two places at one time. So they were in Christ and in Colossae. The important thing is that they were in Christ. It doesn't matter that they were in Colossae. If Paul was writing to us, he would say, to the Christians there in Christ who are in Eustace. It doesn't matter if we're in Hong Kong. It doesn't matter if we're in New York. It doesn't matter if we're in Jerusalem doesn't matter where we are as long as we are in Christ. And the only way to get in Christ is to repent of our sins and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Have you ever done that? Ever been a time in your life when you surrendered fully and completely to the Lord Jesus Christ? Chasing down 24 years now, I've been walking with the Lord. July 27, 1997. What a glorious day that was for me. When was your July 27th, 1997? When was your day that you repented of your sins and surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ? And I've been saying it for years now. True biblical faith, there will always be a radical and a sustained difference in your life. 
Somebody says to me, I'm born again, I got saved the other night, and there's not a radical difference in their life. It does not carry them through. They've never been born again. They prayed an empty prayer that didn't mean nothing. They got baptized, they got wet. They didn't surrender to Jesus Christ. There must be a radical and a sustained difference in a person's life. There's nowhere in the Bible that says somebody got saved and they just went back and kept on living like they were. Nowhere. So I'm going to go with what the Bible says and not what somebody might think because we're giving a pass to our family members who are living in sin. Instead of saying, you know what? The Bible says to check the fruit and I'm looking at the fruit and I don't see a whole lot of fruit there. Have you been born again? Online? You still with us? Has the Lord Jesus Christ spoken to you? Right there in the town that you're in. In California, in New York, in Ohio, South Carolina, and even across the pond in Africa. God can do a work right there in your life, and He wants to do a greater work in your city, just like He wants to do a greater work in this city. But it comes when people surrender themselves. Next, we're going to look at how faithful this church was and some things that Paul commended them on. But a faithful church that's on fire for God is made up of faithful individual Christians on fire for God. This is a team effort. Just like nobody wins the Super Bowl unless the whole team is out there trying hard. Won't happen unless the entire team is on deck. Let's all stand for prayer. Today will be a great day to surrender your life to the Lord. Today will be a great day to Come back home if you're walking in a guilty distance. Today be a great day to lay a burden down at the foot of the cross. Today be a great day to come down here and say, God, I don't want to just sing a song because it's got a cool beat and because it sounds good, but God, I want that to be a reality in my life. I want greater things to happen in my life so I can see greater things happen in my family, greater things happen in my church, greater things happen in my city. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, you overwhelm us by your goodness. We sang about it this morning already. That we love you and we praise you, not because of what you do for us, but because of who you are. You are a great God and greatly to be praised. And Father, we pray that even now the Holy Spirit would speak deep into the recesses of our hearts and minds and not one person would leave here the same way they came in. And Lord, even for those watching online, Lord, I pray that they have not allowed their minds to wander, but they also will get on their knees right there in their living rooms right now, all around the world, and they will cry out to you. And Father, do a great work in this city, do a great work in their city. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.